Park Church, thanks so much for joining us again for our online service. In a minute, we're going to hear from Pastor Joe with another installment of our Highlights from Philippians series. But before we do that, we're going to enter into a time of worship. So we encourage you to come and join us. I know you might be at home, watching with your family, or maybe by yourself, but join the rest of your church family as we worship together. Stand 
Well, as we continue to worship, I just wanted to read a scripture and just share it with you. And I hope that encourages you this morning as we worship and as we sing together. So it comes from Psalm 34 and it says this. It says, I will praise the Lord at all times. and I will constantly speak his praises. I will boast only in the Lord. Let all those who are hopeless take heart. Come, let us tell of the Lord's greatness and let us exalt his name together. For I prayed to the Lord and he answered me and he freed me from all my fears. Those who look to him for help will be radiant with joy. No shadow of shame will darken their faces. And in my desperation, I prayed and the Lord listened. He saved me from all my troubles. And that's just a beautiful prayer and scripture for us to meditate on this morning as we worship, just that we serve a God who hears us when we call out to him. We serve a God who's not far away, but he's as close as the mention of his name. And so wherever you find yourself watching this this morning, I just encourage you to worship and to go to that place. Let's worship together. at home or not, you're welcome to if you'd like. Here we go.
We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high. With all creation cry, God, we praise you. Oh, we praise you, Jesus.
we just thank you for the reminder in the scripture so many times. Time and time again, we're reminded that your love endures forever. From generation to generation, God, you are faithful, you are true, and you're worthy of our praise. We just thank you that you meet us wherever we are, whatever time of day, you're there with us, Jesus. We just invite you to speak to us now. Park Church Online, so glad that you chose to sit down and join with me today as we look into God's Word. And really, we're thinking about you today as you're, you're home. Maybe you're watching this on a cell phone or you have it playing in the background as you're at work or doing things around the home. And we really believe that by you setting aside this time uh, to hear from God that He is going to speak to you, that He's faithful to do that. So we're in week seven, if you haven't been tracking along with us in the book of Philippians, in a series really highlights from the book of Philippians. And I'm really enjoying this sort of slow walk through Paul's letter to a burgeoning church in ancient Macedonia. And so today we're actually going to be moving into chapter 4, which is the final chapter, the final few paragraphs of Paul's letter. And it's at this point Paul is really bringing his letter to a close, right? He's, he's tying up loose ends and he's packed a lot. We've packed a lot into these previous six weeks. And Paul's even gone back to revisit, we've said. He's repeated himself or emphasized some thoughts, but here towards the end, there's still some things that he wants to address, so there's nothing left unsaid. And so although he's talked about unity in the body in general, Paul opens really in chapter 4 with a specific address to two women who he names specifically. Their no names are Eurodia and Syntyche. Maybe you read those names and you're like, who, what? And so Paul addresses these two women and he really uses strong words and he's pleading with them. I, I, I feel the emotion in Paul's words as it says that he pleads with them as he did in the previous chapter where he said he was writing these words and in fact moved to tears as he wrote them. Both of these women had worked alongside of Paul and they were of the they were co-laborers with him of the, the same purpose, but they were not of the same mind or of the same vision. And that really is dangerous because you can have the same direction or goal. We're all looking towards the goal. We've been talking about that, and we did last week. We're looking towards the same goal, but we can have a different vision about how we're going to get there. And this really causes division in the body. Quite literally, division is division, two visions. We can't reach the same destination with a different vision. And so Paul is pleading with them, be of the same mind, unite together, and agree on how you're going to get there. He, he names them out. He doesn't call out anybody else, except he does give a shout out by name to another believer named Clement. And he says that his name is written in the book of life. It's worth noting that at this point, in the conclusion of Paul's letter, that his literary style changes. Commentators write that Paul trims down his language. We're, we're getting to the end of the letter. He trims down his language in, to a minimum in order to communicate with as much precision and emphasis and persuasion as possible. And so what does Paul have to say before he, he signs off, before he writes what is perhaps the final correspondence, his final words to his beloved brothers and sisters, he writes to them to carry on in their pursuit of God's purpose. He's writing that they would carry on with the principles rooted in Christ's love for them. And he wants them to do so in a way that causes others to come to know Christ. So before we jump into that, I just want to pray. Father, thank you so much for the richness of your word. I pray today wherever people are listening, wherever they're watching this, 
that you may speak to them through the eternal truths that you have for us. Impart a seed in us today. May our lives be forever changed. In Jesus' name, amen. It's, it's been many times over the last six weeks that I've mentioned, and perhaps you picked up on this, that Philippians is known as the joyful epistle. And we've seen Paul mention joy or rejoicing quite a number of times. I'll run through a few of them quickly. He says, I always pray with joy. Because of this, I rejoice. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. Make my joy complete. You too should be glad and rejoice with me. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy. Rejoice in the Lord. You are my joy, my joy and my crown. And so up to this point, we haven't actually discussed the significance of joy, specifically in the book of Philippians or its implications in our lives. And truthfully, it seems most appropriate to me to address joy now at the end of Philippians, now that we see all of Paul's emphasis and working together of this crucial theme. We've seen him mention it over and over. And then he returns to it here in the closing of his letter to Philippians. And we're going to read it in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Don't forsake the punctuation when you're reading scripture. We, you got to read it like it's there because that's how it was intended to be read. Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Joy is an important remnant of a genuine encounter with Christ. Paul had this evidence in his life as he sat in prison, as he sat waiting trial because he had experienced Christ firsthand. He had joy where he was. It was undeniable. He had had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus and now Paul had come to know the full acceptance of Jesus and Christ's love for him. Despite all that he had done in persecuting the believers, the early Christians, the followers of the way, as we're told in the book of Acts, despite all of that, Paul had come to know deeply that he was loved and accepted by Christ. And so this all things new aspect of our walk of faith with Jesus, this new walk, leaves a deposit of joy in our soul. See, our sins have been washed away. They've been removed from us completely. They've been separated from us as far as the east is from the west. We said our sins are no longer haunting us. They're no longer trailing us. They're no longer weighing us down because in Jesus, we have been made truly free. See, we're alive in him, and our lives have purpose in him. And this causes our souls to leap within us right from the upper room of the palace to the dungeon basement prison. We have joy in us because we're made new in Jesus. And King David knew this experience. You know, David sinned in one of the worst ways we can think of in terms of Bible heroes, King David had seen another man's wife, Bathsheba, bathing, and he desired her. He took her, even though Uriah, her husband, was a faithful servant in David's army. David took Bathsheba, and then he sent Uriah out to die in battle. And we'll save you the rest of the details, but you can read them. And so David comes to realize his mistake through the prophet Nathan, and so he repents. He repents of his sin and he turns. And in prayer, what he says is that as this burden is lifted from me, as I'm renewed, as I'm being made new, as I'm being made into this new creation, this is what he says in Psalm 51. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. He's praying, bring back up in me the spring of life that is a river of joy. Because being found in you, God, brings great joy to my soul. 
And it's all tied to our relationship with Christ. Joy and rejoicing are tied to our salvation. Therefore, it is not conditional in our lives. See, there's no question as to whether we possess joy or not. We have it as long as we're in Christ. And therefore, we just need to access it. We have to actively pursue joy. We have to turn away from the contamination of the world. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. He says, always, he emphasizes it, rejoice. He's saying, hear me out, Philippians, rejoice. Put on your garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. That's how the prophet Isaiah put it. We need joy. Philippians, church today, joy is within you. Dust it off. You might need to renew the, the oil of joy that is Christ that he gives us and put on the effort to rejoice or to pray like David prayed, restore to me the joy of your salvation. You see, the unconditional love of Christ towards us produces unconditional joy within us. Let me say it again. The unconditional joy of Christ towards us produces unconditional joy within us. It, it's outside of circumstance, right? It's outside and beyond the, the pressure or the pressing that we said, the, the pushing on of our purpose. It's joy even in the midst of opposition. And listen, we could go on and on about joy as Paul displayed. He had joy even as Paul and Silas were in stocks in prison. And they were able to at midnight sing hymns of praise because they had joy. Not conditional on their circumstance. And that joy was powerful that the prison shook and the doors were open. But we have, to, we have to move on. Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all. And, and that term gentleness was often used as an attitude of kindness where the normal or expected response was retaliation. And so this truly is the picture of Christian joy, the definition of joy that Christ followers have. See, Paul has spent so much time highlighting this. It's steadfast joy despite circumstances, despite what the expected response should be or is normally. And we see it in the, in the quote about joy most often quoted outside of this, which we find in the book of Nehemiah. And so Nehemiah was rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, and they encountered great opposition to this great project. They, in fact, had to work with a shovel in one hand and a sword in the other. And they finally completed the, completed the walls. They put the gates in place, and then they opened the book of the law Ezra, the priest, opened the book of the law and read it aloud for people to hear. The, in, the inhabitants, the exiles, were coming back and repopulating the holy city, Jerusalem, where the temple was. And as they heard the book of the law read aloud, they began to weep and they began to mourn. But Nehemiah told them, listen, despite the circumstances, despite having missed out on, on observing God's commands and observing sacred holidays, we have a cause to rejoice. He says it in Nehemiah 8 and 10, and you see it there on your screen, the joy of the Lord is your strength. We need to tap into that joy and live. You need to tap into that kind of joy right where you are. As we said, the Philippians lived in a city which would be much like we are, where there's diverse types of people with diverse beliefs. You need to tap into the joy in your city, in your town, where you may experience testing and hardship and pressure. However, the evidence of Christ within us will be the joy that exudes from our lives in the midst of all that life has for us. I love this quote by Mother Teresa. She said, joy is a net of love by which you can catch souls. Joy is 
attractive. Joy brings people in. It's evidence of Christ in you. It's tied to your salvation. To this, Paul adds, the Lord is near. The Lord is near. You see, the Philippians were, you know, close proximity to Jesus' death, right? Not, not as we are, you know, centuries later, but very close. And so they were already thinking about Jesus' return. But even now, Jesus' return or his, his coming, he's near. But he's also near in our lives when we intentionally make rejoicing in his love for us a priority. He's near. And then Paul takes that the Lord is near and he goes on quickly. No, no adjoining words, no special punctuation, right? He's just hitting us left and right, getting to the point. He says then in verse 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. You see, anxiety is a big issue in our society today. And and it's no longer just with adults. We see it in in young people and we see it in children. It's this crippling anxiety that keeps us bound, that, that overwhelms our thoughts And, you know, I spoke more extensively about worry and anxiety back in the fall. We said that worry and anxiety can't be the substance of your soul. That we're marinating. The word for worry is like the word marinating. We can't marinate on the wrong things. We said that worry doesn't work for us because we were created for so much more. You were created with a purpose. We weren't created to stew and to worry. And Jesus admonishes us, do not worry. But he does so in the context of you're worth so much more than sparrows or lilies, which he too looks after. He cares about those. So then how much more so does he care about you and me? And if you want to watch that message that we did on worry, we'll, we'll link it in the description of this video. Or you can wait until the very end and play through the upcoming Videos. And the truth is, we have to get beyond anxiety and worry because they work against us. They work against us in fulfilling God's plan and purpose in our lives because they, they cripple us and they keep us bound. They cause us to shrink back from our purpose. And so Paul's encouragement to the Philippians is that they would live a lifestyle worthy of the calling and worthy of the gospel of Christ. He admonished them to live this way so that they could be a light where they are. These are the words that we we pull into chapter 4. This is what Paul has been encouraging the church in Philippi to live like. Therefore, when we get to chapter 4 and we see this, I don't think that Paul is addressing anxiety in particular. But I think moreover he's addressing a practice that again flows from the life of a disciple of Christ. And that is, in every situation, my instinct should be to run to God. We should present our request to God. We should go to him in every situation. Or as I was praying this week, I felt like God was saying, lay it all out there. That's what he wants for us. He wants us to lay it all out there. Don't hold anything back. See, we can't hold on to our thoughts or our concerns. Otherwise, that's how they turn to anxiety and worry. Instead, we need to release them to God in prayer. Prayer being that sacred place of fellowship and intimate friendship with Jesus. That's what, that's what prayer is. John Stott writes this. He says, in prayer... Anxiety is resolved by trust in God. That which causes the anxiety is brought to the one who is totally competent in and in whose hands the matter may be left. In thanksgiving, anxiety is resolved by the deliberate acceptance of worrying circumstance as something which an all-wise, all-loving, remember that, all-loving and all-sovereign God has appointed. It's presenting your request to God with the acceptance that the Lord is near. He's near to you 
when you pray, he's near to you as you call on him. He's near to you as the one who you love. He's the shepherd of his sheep. We need to listen to his voice in the sacred place, in the place of fellowship and of friendship. See, love is the answer. You know, whenever I'm in prayer about something, whenever I'm running to God, whether it's because I'm feeling overwhelmed or I have some desperate need or I need wisdom or insight, as I sit and listen to God, I, I can picture it because, you know, I have a specific place and chair where I do my morning devotions. As I go to that place and I shut things out, I enter into this place of fellowship and intimate friendship with Jesus. What I don't hear him say is what I expect or want him to say. I don't hear him say to my issues, peace be still. I don't hear him say right away that everything is going to be all right. I don't see the direction that he wants to give. And the principle is that this thing that I'm bringing, his answer, that only addresses what I need today. That only addresses my concerns today. But what Jesus speaks to me, and what I believe Paul is saying we really need, is a principle that is so much more important and eternal, and that is the fact that Jesus loves me. That's what he speaks. He says, I love you. You're loved. You're accepted. You're enough. And just as we sang earlier in the service, how great is your love for us. It's with that simple statement, your love, that we're undergirded with the trust. It's God saying, I've got this under control. And so there's no need to worry. There's no need to be anxious or unstable. We're not slipping because I love you. I've got this. There's no need for anxiety. And so Paul's less concerned about anxiety, anxiety specifically and more concerned about the posture and practice of the church that no matter what we're faced with in every situation, meaning every day, we find ourselves in the humble position of prayer before God and with an attitude of thanksgiving, we let our requests be made known to him. We lay it all out there. That's what he's talking about, that we would become a people of his presence by being a people of prayer in every situation. And of course he says, with thanksgiving. Because thanksgiving helps us to focus on the goodness of God, the faithfulness, the, all the reasons we have to trust him. And so posturing ourselves in this way releases God's promise as we pray. We know he will respond. Listen to this in Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. Verse 4 says, He will cover you with his feathers. Under his wing you'll find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and your rampart. This is a place of security and safety in the presence of the Lord. The place that quells our fears or our worries or anxiety, no matter what the request. And this place is also the place of heavenly peace. Heavenly peace that Paul describes in Philippians 4 and 7. So we're praying, we're presenting our request to God, and then he says, and the peace of God which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And so the result of this kind of faithful and thankful prayer is peace. He says, if the Philippians will follow his advice, then the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will stand like a garrison over their hearts and their minds. And so this imagery that Paul is saying is the same imagery as Psalm 91, the, the refuge, the shield, the rampart, the mighty fortress or stronghold that is the presence of God. Proverbs 18 and 10 says that the name of the Lord is a fortified tower. Or maybe you learn that verse as that it's a, a strong tower or a strong fortress. 
He says the righteous run into it and they are safe. They're in a place of safety and properly a place of peace when we run to the Lord. They seek him in prayer. They present their requests and all things. And then the word there for guard your hearts is a military word. It's the language we said Paul was using earlier in chapter 3. That it's a military word that's to watch over like a military sentinel. To watch over, to keep, to protect. This is the aggressive approach that the Lord takes over the hearts and minds of those that will humble themselves in appealing to him. See, our understanding in the New Testament of the word peace actually comes from uh, the Old Testament. It has its origins there. Peace, in other words, shalom, possesses in it the root meaning for the word wholeness. And properly by implication, it means wholeness wholeness within, wholeness with God, and wholeness without with others. Wholeness outwardly with others. They use it as a greeting, common greeting to say shalom, peace in you, peace with God, peace around you. And and I'd love to do a series about peace because properly it is the right way God intended things to be. His intended way. The peace of God can only come from an almighty God who is himself our peace. Peace is absent outside of his presence. Peace just does not exist without God because God is peace. Philippians 2 verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. That was the hostility that our sin created and the division between us and God that Jesus eradicated on the cross. And so because of Jesus, the God of peace is the God who makes peace between himself and sinners. And so the peace of God is linked to the work of salvation again. We can't know the peace that our souls need. The kind of peace that our hearts and our minds need outside of a relationship with Christ. Those bumper stickers were famous a few years ago and maybe you remember them. No Jesus, no peace. No Jesus, no peace. Because along with everything Paul is saying, joy, prayer, Peace, these are all the outflow of a disciple or a follower of Jesus. Those that are in relationship with him. Those that have an awareness of the implications of his imminence or his nearness to us. See, as I walk every day in a loving relationship with Jesus, I have joy. The Lord is near as I run to the strong tower, which is Christ. And in prayer and thanksgiving, the Lord is near and he shows his love for me. My heart and my mind are guarded in Christ because he possesses my whole heart. I'm fully his. He's near and he'll never leave me or forsake me. I love, I love the expression here by Paul that this peace from God passes understanding, or in other words, it's beyond comprehension. Because it's precisely when things are falling apart, when everything that can go wrong has go wrong, have gone wrong, that the follower of Christ can retain their peace even though the earth beneath them gives way. It's because of Jesus. He's the key to the equation. He's the key. Others will look at you and say to you, well, aren't you worried? Aren't, aren't, aren't you afraid? Shouldn't you be scared? Shouldn't you be panicking or distraught or discouraged a little? And you can genuinely say, no, I'm not. I know that I should be, but God's given me a peace about it. And you can watch their eyes widen and their jaws drop and they ask, How? How can you have peace about something that seems so traumatic and so devastating? We understand it because Paul explained to us in 1 Corinthians. He said, but people who aren't spiritual can't receive the truths from God's spirit. The peace that passes understanding comes through Christ. 
And only those who are spiritual can understand these things. This is God's peace. Beyond logic or comprehension or understanding, it's part of the, his nature. The nature of God that he imparts to us. And then it radiates from our life to those around him, us who don't know him. It's the intangible desire that they long for to have peace within the people in your community around you, they long for peace within. They want to know that they have peace with God and they're, they're desperate that in their life they would have peace externally and with others. But in order to receive this kind of peace, we first have to receive the God of peace who reconciled all things to himself through his son. The God of peace is the God of salvation who does away with sin through the cross of Jesus. And the peace of God is also the, the power of God. He's the God of power. He's the God of victory. Victory over death in the grave. He's the God of peace. These words from Paul are, are, are so important, though they're just three simple verses that he's drawing his letter to a close. I picture Paul maybe running out of parchment, and so he's just hitting us each and every verse with a knockout punch. Rejoice! I say it again, rejoice, the Lord is near. Let your life of prayer run into his presence. Let it guide you. Let him run to him and his peace will never be absent from you as you walk with him. Like a military, it's going to be relentless in, in surrounding you no matter what you're going through. There's no quit, no giving up. Paul knows that if the Philippians will live in this way, if the believers will follow his words, they're never going to fall away from their faith. They'll never walk away. They'll never not possess joy. And the joy, everything that is exuding from their life is going to draw others to Jesus. Their life of thanksgiving will be attractive and inspiring. And when everyone else is subject to worry and peace is failing, they're going to be the embodiment of the answer to everyone's turmoil, which is a relationship with Christ. See, it all points back to Jesus. He said earlier that he wanted to know Christ and him crucified. That was, that was all that was in Paul to communicate that it's all about Jesus. You know, our own barometer on any of these things gives us a good in indication of where we're at in our relationship with Christ. Have we lost our joy do we run to him constantly and openly, consistently? Do we have that in our prayer life? Do we, do we know the fellowship and friendship of Jesus? Do we, does he guard our hearts and our minds? Do we have his peace? If you're facing any of these, I want to encourage you to commit to continue pursuing Christ in your life. This is what Paul earnestly desired for the church in Philippi. It's what his words to us today earnestly are begging us to follow, to stand firm in the love of Christ in this way so that our lives can continue to be a light to those who don't know him so that others can come to the same saving knowledge. That's what we need today. We need Jesus. Have you received him? in your life. It's very simple as we pray. You can receive Christ and have all things made new. You can have the deposit of joy. You can have entrance into fellowship and friendship with your Savior where you don't need a mediary, but you can go directly to God with whatever need you have in every situation with prayer and thanksgiving. And then you can trust assuredly that his peace will follow. If you're willing to pray and receive him, he will give you his peace. He is the God of peace. And so I want to pray with you today as we close. Wherever you are, you can bow your head and pray from your heart the very same. Jesus, I thank you that you died on the cross for our sins, that you reconciled all things to yourself, and that you are the God of peace. Lord, I need the deposit of your joy. I want to rejoice each and every day. 
I want to be able to come to you with whatever I need, with my requests, my worries, and know that you love me. Restore that to me today. Make it new or make it for the first time. And God, I pray right now for those that are just calling out to you in their heart or they're doing it from their lips or they're thinking the thoughts, urging you to visit them right now. I pray through the Holy Spirit you begin to flood in with your peace. May they experience tangibly the peace that passes all understanding beyond reason, beyond logic, in the midst of their circumstance, their toil and their trial. Be with them right now because the Lord is near. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for joining along with me and praying that prayer. If you did, I'd love to hear about it. You can text the word LIFE to 587-600-1905 and tell us how you've begun a new life with Jesus. The old is gone and the new has come. The joy has been made as a deposit in your life and you now experience his peace. We'd love to hear from you. Have a great week. We'll see you again next week for another highlight in the book of Philippians.